the history of energy transformation in Germany. It's a, a pretty fascinating case study. Um, Tom received his PhD from Clark University where he did a self-design major, uh, major in um, environment, technology, and society. Um, from there he did uh, a postdoc at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich. And then he went to Germany where he was, at, uh, he was a fellow at the uh, Brunegger Foundation associated with the University of Stuttgart where he remains affiliated as a member of the um, International Advisory Board for the Center for Interdisciplinary Risk and Innovation Studies. So he makes regular trips to Germany. I think you were just there fairly recently. Mm -hmm. And um, fortunately for us, he just joined Western here in the fall. And so it's his first year at Western as a member of the Institute for Energy Studies and also Huxley College. So thanks very much. Thanks, Uh, great. Well, I would just start with a couple comments about um, why I think this is an important topic to study and why you made such a great decision coming here to spend an hour listening to me talk about it or engaging in a conversation with it about it on such a nice sunny day, um, which I'm getting used to here. Well, we know climate change is happening. I guess this is all part of it, people tell me. They're not supposed to be sunny. Um, climate change is happening and it's caused by human activities, right? Sea level is rising, which is changing the coasts of continents. It's, um, subside, it's uh, covering islands. Uh, global warming is creating algal blooms in Lake Whatcom in the summer. I guess that's why the water tasted so bad when I got here. And uh, New public health threats. I don't know if you heard about the genetically altered mosquitoes they're going to release in Florida to combat chikungunya, a new disease to South Florida. Anyway, we're seeing the disruption of ecosystems, lots and lots of things I know you've heard about many, many times. Uh, but these things are happening. They might be happening very slowly. Uh, but if we pay attention to the scientists who are carefully observing these things, we we have very high confidence that a lot of these effects of climate change are being felt already. So we've already seen seven or eight inches of sea level rise in the last hundred years, and the next 85 should show us three to six feet of sea level rise. And um, you know, what concerns me about that is that we're handing over to the next generation a world that is in transition, uh, and not necessarily in positive ways. We're handing them a world that might be less able to be lived on uh, as well as we're able to live on it. And everybody, I think, wants to leave the next generation a better world than the one we inherited. We're not on track for doing that, right? So after the seas raise three to six feet by 2100, they keep rising. And if all the ice melts, you're talking about 200 feet higher seas. Um, so we're dooming future generations to live in constant retreat of the coasts, not to mention all the other problems associated with this. And we know that climate change is caused by, primarily by humans burning fossil fuels, combusting carbon. And uh, if we stop doing that, we can slow the effects of many of these uh, of these projected climate changes that we're seeing. So that's why paying attention to energy system transitions is so important. It's how we use and produce energy that's changing the planet. And we have to decide now how much change we want to be responsible for in the future. Um, so you might say that energy transitions are happening everywhere all the time, that we're engaged in one, look at the price of gas today as opposed to a few months ago. Uh, and that's true, but I think that what's happening in Germany is really, really fundamentally different from what's happening in the States. Because what's going on in Germany is they're intentionally sitting down and planning to restructure the energy technology and the energy economy and the way people live and use energy. In a very conscientious, directly planned approach. Um, and so that's what, I, that's what they feel is needed in order to make this massive transformation that needs to happen. And I hope today I give you some sense of what's going on in Germany, how significant it is to the German public, 
And, um, and then hopefully we'll have a little conversation at the end about what that means for us here. So the, um, the big word is Energiewende. That means energy transformation. It's all over the German press and it's kind of common lexicon today. As you know, Germany is a big country in the middle of Europe. It's one of the first, with, together with France, Luxembourg, Holland, uh, made the European Union back in the 1950s. So Germany has been committed to the European Union since the beginning, right? And it's a major leader in the European Union. Uh, it's a big country, 82 million people compared to the states, about a quarter of our size, but still a huge a country um, with a GNP of three and a half trillion compared to the United States, 16 trillion. But what I wanted to point out is this last line, the export economy. Germany's a massive export economy, all right? It's got a quarter of the people that we do, but it exports almost the same amount that we do, one and a half trillion dollars out of a three and a half trillion dollar economy. So it's the third largest exporting economy in the world. So in other words, we're talking about a country that has a huge industrial export-based economy, right? You would think that would be highly dependent on electricity and energy. So if Germany can do it, anybody can do it. That's the lesson to take from that. Uh, Germany produces, on the other hand, unlike the states, almost no fossil fuels except for coal. It mines lignite coal. And uh, lignite is a soft coal. It's a young coal. It's called brown coal. And it's uh, kind of nasty because it's easy to dig up, easy to burn, <clears throat> but it produces a lot of carbon dioxide when you burn it. So yeah, everybody's probably heard that coal produces one and a half times as much carbon dioxide as gas for the same amount of energy. Well, lignite produces three times as much as gas. So, and uh, of the 10 worst carbon dioxide, single source carbon dioxide emitters in Europe, six of the German lignite plants are in the top 10. So these are massive plants, so producing a lot of energy, four gigawatts, 3.6 gigawatts, 2.4 gigawatts, and these six plants make 16 gigawatts of electricity. And just to give you a sense of that, a big, plant, a big coal plant here might be one and a half gigawatts. The Grand Coulee Dam is 6.8 gigawatts, biggest hydropower. Um, so these are really, really big electricity generally. They just dig it up and burn it right there. And they're producing a lot of carbon dioxide, 140 megatons of million tons of uh, carbon dioxide. And this little picture at the lower bottom is uh, the Germans' total carbon dioxide emissions are 830 megatons. Well, the lignite plants, these six lignite plants alone, are about a sixth of that. So big, big monsters to deal with. But still, when you compare all this to the states, Germany is kind of a small player in the fossil fuel market. Just to give you a sense of where we stand in this, and I try to go back and forth with the states and Germany to give you some perspective here. All I did was I added up all the petroleum that Germany and the U.S. produce, and then I averaged, you know, normalized it. So Germany produces hardly any petroleum, a little bit of coal, and uh, not hardly any gas. In fact, they import fossil fuels. We talk a lot in this country about our energy security, right? We don't want to be dependent on foreign sources of oil and this and that. Well, look at Germany. I mean, there are 81% of their dependence on hard coal comes from abroad. 98% of their petroleum, 86% of their gas, and 100% of their uranium. So this is not the case for the states. So you're talking about a country that's built a massive exporting economy about as big as ours, totally dependent on other countries for fuel. All right, so I just, you know, we hear all this rhetoric in the states about the need for energy security. Sometimes it's good to look and see what other countries are doing. Uh, you may know Germany as a country that's been very, very, um, engaged in strong 
anti-nuclear protest for years and years and years. The Germans are probably you know, more anti-nuclear than any other country on the planet. And they've a couple times gone through the process of deciding to shut down their nuclear power plants. But uh, when Fukushima Daiichi Di Di uh, Di plant was um, flooded with the tsunami after the earthquake, within just a week or so of that, the Germans parliament voted to shut down half of their nuclear power plants permanently. And the vote was 500 and whatever, 13 to 79. So it was a really, really strong social consensus that we want to get out of this technology. We've had enough of nuclear power. The Germans had gone through this before. After Chernobyl in 86, um, actually one of my professors at Clark University had a team of students in Germany, West Germany at the time, and he was, they were out doing background measuring of radiation for a class project, and they were the first to discover the Chernobyl radiation, figure that out. Um, a couple of days later, the Swedes reported it. But Chernobyl had a huge effect on German and, uh, nuclear politics, and after Chernobyl, they vowed to shut down their nuclear plants, and then um, what happened is uh, climate change came along, and they reconsidered that decision. But this time they decided it's for good. Those are all the nuclear reactors. They shut down eight of the reactors. Um, they still have nine operating. That's their location, mostly in the south. So that's kind of um, a little background on Germany. Now, what is the energy vendo? What is this energy transition? And um, it goes back, um, well, no, for, before I get to the history, just basically what are the components of this? The first part is to eliminate nuclear power by 2022. Shut down all the rest of those plants, decommission them, and to also reduce greenhouse gases 80% by 2050. And there are other goals along the way. At the same time, they want to do that by shutting down a lot of those lignite plants and coal burning plants. They want to increase renewable energy, at the same time use a lot less energy, make buildings more efficient, and use a lot less petroleum by switching to electric vehicles. And a big thing for Germany too is to democratize energy. This is a big part of this discussion, is the democratization of energy and the elimination of energy poverty in Germany. I think it's interesting that uh, Chancellor Angela Merkel, before she was chancellor, said renewables will never be more than 15% of the market. And then you probably know it was her that made the commitment to get Germany to these goals of, uh, that I just mentioned there, the energy Venda goals. So Merkel's really came, come around on this full circle. This whole, this whole party begins in 1980 um, when there was a federal conference about climate change. Yes, climate change in 1980. Who was talking about that? This, Jimmy Carter was president. So the Germans were already thinking about carbon-based climate change in 1980 and the nuclear phase-out, wanting to phase out nuclear power. Then you had Chernobyl, which really said, okay, we're shutting down all these plants, and they had a plan for shutting down their nuclear power plants, but then really came along Kyoto and the whole United Nations Framework Convention for Climate Change in 1990 and the first Kyoto Agreements that um, Germans said, okay, this is super serious. We can't shut down the nuclear plants. We've got to deal with carbon first. And they made commitments in the first uh, Kyoto round uh, to, sh to uh, reduce their emissions by 21% by 2008 to 2012. They reached, I think, 25% in 2008, so, or even before 2008. Um, so even before the economic collapse, they had reached their goals. And uh, most of the, a lot of the other countries didn't in Europe. And of course, the US didn't participate. Uh, we're together with Andorra and South Sudan as the only three countries that didn't sign the Ky or ratify the Kyoto Agreement. 
Um, but Germany and the European nations did, and they set these first round goals, and Germany met those, and then they set a second set of uh, Kyoto goals for 40% uh, by 2020. That's the new set that they're working toward now. But the big thing that is responsible for the energy transition in Germany is the renewable energy law called the EEG, the Renewable Energy Act, which actually started in 91 and got revised a bunch of times, most recently in 2009, which is the big law that set the feed-in tariffs to make sure that people could have, who bought renewable energy um, machinery, infrastructure, could afford to sell the power, could afford that in, uh, uh, investment by selling the power at specified prices. Now, this is a super complicated law. It's not at all simple. It's, it specifies exactly for which technologies and what size, exactly which price you'll get and for what year, depending on all the other things the market are doing, is doing. So it, it would take forever to explain what goes into the law, but it is the main vehicle that's driving innovation in Germany. And this is the best graph, I think, that summarizes this complex set of German goals, all right? So um, on the left, we have kind of the benchmarks. And mostly they're 2008. The top three are 2008. Um, the top one is total power consumption. So this is electricity they're talking about here. And you can see by 2020, they want to reduce total power use, the number of kilowatts used by 90%, or they want to reduce it by 10% to 90% and eventually getting to 75%. So you're talking about using yet less electricity for this whole future. And then the green is the renewable energy. That share is going up every year till it gets to 80% um, uh, in 2050. The second line here is the total energy consumption. So here they're adding in aircraft fuel, petroleum, cars, heat, everything. And you see they want to use 50% of the energy they're using in 2008 by 2050. So making the country much more energy efficient. Um, and that's a big part of that is the heating demand in buildings, which uh, we heard from Joel, Joel uh, Swisher a couple weeks ago talk about how important buildings are. They want to reduce that to 20% of its 2008 energy consumption. Um, and then the the uh, fourth line there is transport, cars, they want to reduce to 60%. And greenhouse gases, um, as I say, they came down already, they met their first Kyoto target, they set a second one, 40% lower by 2020, with a long-term target of 80% lower by 2050. But what does this mean just for the electricity sector? What you see on this graph is the unwanted power sources on the top, the grayed out areas, playing less and less a role, while the green sources and the yellow sources play more and more a role, and the blue ones. So the top one, the purple, is the nuclear. And you can see it disappears in 2022. And the others are the hard coal and the lignite uh, and natural gas. And on the bottom here, we have, of course, uh, solar, and then hydropower, and um, biofuels, and uh, a little bit of geothermal, and wind is the big German solution. Wind is the big one. So uh, we're just gonna talk about electricity first a little bit. How has Germany been doing this? What's it been doing? And probably if you've been to Germany, you've seen solar cells everywhere. Solar, they're finding all kinds of things to put solar cells on. And in a typical village you'll go to, probably like about that many houses will have solar on them. Yeah. Even a church. And a few of these parks, I mean Germany doesn't have a lot of land and these parks kind of larger solar installations of like 20 megawatts or so, there are very few of these. They account for very little. Mostly it's meeting its solar capacity by putting small arrays of like one to six kilowatts on houses. 
And wind is very big in Germany. They're trying uh, to open up the North Sea, putting windmills there. And this is the first wind plant that opened in 2013. It was a 400 megawatt system. Um, up that the North Sea is in the far left corner up there. Most of the wind in Germany is in the northern part. It's the size of those dots, not so much. And this is Bavaria down here, Munich. And, uh, but the North Sea is, they're installing quite a bit of wind power there. I think they've got another 200 megawatts. They've got a gigawatt installed and another 200 megawatts ready to go, but the wires aren't connected yet. This is a summary of the um, parks. They're all next to Denmark there in that little bit of ocean between Germany and Denmark. So a lot, a lot of, lot of activity going on there. And one of the challenges is how to get that energy distributed across the rest of the country. I'll say something about that in a second. So when we look at total installed capacity, and what capacity is, of course, is how much electricity you could generate if you were using these things full speed. And so we measure it in watts. And um, uranium is about 12 gigawatts. Remember, I said the Cooley Dam is 6.8 gigawatts. So uranium is 12 gigawatts. The lignite plants are 21. And I think those six I showed you were 16.8 of that. So there's a bunch of more, but smaller ones. And then the coal plants, they have a lot of coal plants. They're burning coal mostly from Poland and a lot of um, places distribute gas. They do have some, quite a bit of gas capacity. Wind, though, is 35 gigawatts and solar, 38 gigawatts. Oh, okay, with the wind offshore, one gigawatt offshore. So most of that is onshore now. Solar 38, biomass 8 gigawatts, hydro 5, 5.6. So not a lot of hydro. But I think what's interesting to notice here is if you draw a line there, it's so kind of one half is all renewable. So half of the electricity capacity in Germany is renewable power now. That's much more than any place else. Um, and they have some fascinating reports out on what's been going on. The, this is just a couple highlights. You can get these data for any day of the year. Um, how much power was generated by each of these different sources? And this is saying on a May 11th last year, they generated the most of their demand. They de generated 80% of their demand with renewables. And just, of course, during that period when the sun was out, the solar was... So you see here at the bottom, we've got, that's actually um, green. Shows up black on the screen. That's biomass plants. So a lot of communities in Germany are using biomass to generate electricity. And those are kind of like a base load power plant, whether it's coming from a sewage treatment plant or some other kind of source. The light blue is actually hydropower here, small in Germany. Then the dark blue is wind. So it was a windy day. And the yellow is, of course, solar, so it was also a sunny day, we see. But, of course, the sun is only out in the middle of the day. The red line or the purple line is demand. And uh, everything else is the nuclear, lignite, coal, gas. So you can see right here that they're generating more than they need. And the conclusion is that Germany is a big power exporter. Germany does export a lot of electricity in Europe generates much more than it needs. And the windiest day was December 12th last year. They generated 35 gigawatts at the peak. It looks almost like it was 35 gigawatts all day. So you could generate, figure out how many hours of kilowatt hours that is by multiplying gigawatts by 24 hours. But it was a lot of wind, but not so sunny that day. And of course, there are days when, this, when the renewables are almost nothing. It's not windy and it's not sunny, in which place they know they're dependent on, uh, on the fossil fuel plants. But, of course, it can be sunny in the south and windy in the north. So a big question in Germany is how to move this electricity around. 
And um, one, uh, one of the big things that's going on now is trying to cite two big power lines. I want to put them right next to each other, preferably. Uh, and this talking about some sort of corridor that goes there from the North Sea wind farms down to sort of central southern Germany. Um, under the old mantra there that grid is cheaper than storage. So it's really hard to store electricity. Uh, you can put in battery packs and battery tanks, and they're doing that in different places. Lots of experiments with things like that and compressed air. But in the long run, it's much easier to build a power line and export it, import it, share it, and move it around. But this is, of course, very controversial. If you've been to Germany, you know there's not a lot of space. So finding room for two big, huge power lines to go north and south down the country is a challenge. Let me just say a couple words about heat, because heat is twice the amount of energy as Germany uses in electricity. So heat is really the big, we talk, I talk a lot about electricity, a lot of energy Venda stuff is about electricity, but heat is really where it's at. And um, this graph shows you different energy sources per year. Again, the total energy is declining. The mix, the makeup of that energy is gonna move to more renewables. But the bar that I put there, that is all energy devoted to creating heat, gas and um, uh, the gas and the oil. So what can Germany do about that? Well, they're improving building efficiencies. So the standards for building new buildings or houses are very high in terms of energy efficiency. And of course, you can store heat. You can't store electricity, but you can store heat pretty well. So they're building more of these combined heat power systems where you have wind farms that actually generate electricity that heat up water, they store that water, and when people need heat later on, they can take that, move it around. This is, a, of course, a big uh, infrastructure. You have to build these combined heat systems and move the heat around in pipes. The other part of this um, uh, energy vent is the smart grid, which uh, I've heard a little bit before about in this room. Smart meters, in-home displays, web-based platform, feed-in tariffs, time of day pricing, all those kind of things. But this is the whole computerized system of switches and sensors to figure out where electricity is being generated and where it's being used and how we can match these things up as efficiently as possible. And finally, democratization of energy. This is the other component of what's going on here with the energy vendor. There's a lot of new electricity generators, um, a lot of households getting into solars, and a lot of community-based uh, energy cooperatives. Um, they've raised over $800 million, and some, some that you only need $1,000 to join, and you buy into a community wind farm or a community solar farm. Um, and they've really taken off. Um, there's a lot of people studying this. There have been over 700 formed in the last few years. Now they're up to some 700 energy cooperatives. So these are just kind of nerdy neighbors all getting together saying, hey, let's build a cooperative and do this ourselves. And the law makes it really easy for them to do this and sell their power. You also have a, if you ever go, you can go to these gener uh, demonstration villages. There's a lot of villages now that have, um, become 100% renewable. Uh, and uh, Feldheim has gone completely off the grid, so they just cut themselves off. They made their own grid. They don't even import any gas or uh, petroleum for heating, so all their heating is done with wind or solar or biomass. And of course, all their electricity. Um, uh, this is uh, Wildpoldried in uh, southern Bavaria. They're, they've decided their town's going to get in the business of this, and they're selling renewable energy and making, making bank doing this. Oh, it's just a small town. And um, speaking of the democratization of energy, in Germany, really big thing is public engagement, holding meetings, bringing people together, talking about what we need as a community, how we're going to solve these problems. And Germans are really big on this. They, they just love to get together and have public meetings to work out 
their collective problems and come up with collective solutions. And um, it's one of the things I studied in Switzerland, so I'm very interested in how they do it in Germany as well. So I'm just going to turn now to a few challenges and um, go through these ones. The problem of intermittency, the Kyoto obligations, the question of public acceptance cost, and the big four. So one of the challenges you all know from uh, energy is that we don't use the same amount all day long. What people want, the demand goes up and down. So supply has to go up and down. So how do you do that? And um, the method Germany's been using here, this is uh, how it's been. We have biomass on the bottom, uranium, our nuclear plants there, the orange line, then the lignite. And they've been using the black coal plants going up and down, actually. We don't do that with our big coal plants but they've been finding ways to moderate those to fill in the gaps because their eventual goal is to use coal um, as one of those feedstocks that can rise up and meet demand, coal or gas. Hydropower is not strong in Germany, and again, wind is the gray one. That's a big one. Uh, and the question is how to manage all these things and what they see the future as being. <coughs> And these are two graphs showing what they think the mix could look like in 2022 when those nuclear plants are shut down and when they've met their um, second round Kyoto agreements of uh, reducing carbon dioxide by a total of 40 percent. Remember, they're already 25 percent down, so they've got to go another 15, basically. Um, and these show you that they intend to increase the solar, right, to get those, many of those peaks filled with solar and increase the wind. Those are the two big planned solutions. There's not a lot more biomass they can do. It's kind of limited. But you will still need these big, there's a lot of space in there that has to be built with highly flexible other, which is basically coal or gas. So we're, the energy vendor doesn't isn't saying Germany is going to be free of these fuels. It's just say it's going to reduce it. I just thought I'd throw this in to give a sense of comparison on the carbon dioxide emissions. Um, so this is just Germany is black, the United States is red, just normalizing our carbon dioxide. We put out a lot more carbon dioxide than they do, but if you divide what you put out by 1990 by what you put out in 1990, you get one. And then you divide every year what you emitted by what you put out in 1990, so everything's relative. And you can see the United States went up, and then we did all that fracking and replaced coal with gas, and it went down. Oh, plus there was a huge depression that shut down a ton of the economy also in 2008. And Germany, you see, has just been on this path. The, dotted, the first dotted green line was their Kyoto um, number one targets, and the second green line is their Kyoto number two targets. And at the same time, they're very proud that their economic growth has gone up. So this is, you see this graph everywhere. Renewable energy, our carbon emissions are decoupled from economic growth. So their greenhouse gas emissions go down on the bottom, but their economic growth goes up. And if those two lines, they're clearly not correlated, right? So you can have economic growth while producing uh, a renewable energy system. That's one of the big messages Germany would like everyone to know. Of course, public opinion matters. So if the public is not happy, there'll be problems. And of course, there's always somebody complaining because um, they're paying for this not with state subsidies, but by charging people's electric bills. So you pay more per kilowatt hour. That's where the money comes from basically a surcharge on your kilowatt hours. So the people who use electricity are paying for the um, feed-in tariffs. Um, and if you look at public opinion, here's, this is from August. The goals of the Energie Vendor are completely right or mostly right, and that's almost all the pie chart, completely right or mostly right. Of course, people love to complain, so if you ask, 
the way we're going about this are completely right or mostly it's most people think they're not happy with how we're going about it so of course people bicker about what should be done this you know this way or that way but in generally in general they're in favor of the goals but they bicker about how we're going about it so what does it cost this is hard to get the real numbers for this the numbers get thrown around all over the place um, I talked to a lot of people in Germany about this. This is the best I could come up with. 140 billion is what they've raised in these little uh, surcharge onto your electric uses. So basically what households are paying are $280 a year more for electricity, your average German household. And all that adding up to 140 billion. So energy intensive business pays nothing. And in fact, they get a benefit because when people put solar on their roofs, in the middle of the day, electricity gets really cheap. In fact, Germany's had negative electricity prices at times. So industries not only doesn't have to pay for the energy vendor, they also get cheaper power rates in the middle of the day when they want it. And of course, Germany's a major exporting economy. They're not going to do anything to hurt their business. Uh, when you look at the, like our bill, it's made up of lots of little pieces, the top light blue is the what amount they're paying per kilowatt hour for the Renewable Energy Act. 6.2 European cents per kilowatt for renewables last year. Um, and their total residential electric price compared to us was 33 cents. So they pay 33, anybody know what we pay? Yeah, well, 10, yeah. So a lot less, we pay a lot less here. But when you look at the German budget, this is your average German household budget, the green electricity uh, surcharge is 0.4% of their budget, $280. And their electric bill is about 2.2%. Note they pay a lot more on gas and heating. So when you look at it, they charge a lot, they pay a lot more per kilowatt hour than we do. But Germans use a lot less in their houses because their appliances are so efficient and they're very careful about how they use electricity. So in the end, they actually pay less than we do. An average household has less for electricity than we do, even with paying for all of the Renewable Energy Act feed-in tariffs. And I think that's an important sort of take-home message is that everybody complains about how expensive this is in Germany. They're still paying less than we're paying for power. Just because we have such old, antiquated appliances that waste so much electricity, and we're pretty careless on how we use power. People in Germany are more careful. The big four, just so I mentioned them, um, the big four utilities, E.ON, RWE, von Energy Baden-Württemberg, and Fattenfall, these are hated in Germany. Everybody hates these guys. They invested heavy in coal and fossil fuels, even though Energy Vendor was starting up. They were like, well, that'll never work. You're going to come back to us and ask for coal. So I built all these things, and now they're going bankrupt. And RWE, or E.ON, in November, split off to have a whole section just renewables, and they have a little section still doing. So anyway, big changes going with those power plants. But jobs. It's a big one in Germany. Jobs in the renewable industry are way up. A whole lot of the reason Germany's doing this, it didn't just do it with the green left anti-nuclear people. It also had Merkel's from the, you know, the conservative party. They got behind this because they see it as an opportunity to Germany to increase its export markets. They're going to sell all this technology of smart grid, solar, all this stuff. They're going to sell these things to the rest of the world after they figure out how to do it. All right, so in the last couple minutes here, energy transition in Washington State, anybody? First off, the new course. Uh, in the Energy Institute, I'm here with the Institute for Energy Studies and uh, really happy to be offering this course next term on energy system transitions. So we'll look at all these things going on in Germany and elsewhere and what might happen here. So it's cross-listed with environmental studies, which is my home department. 
So here's the USA. Remember, we showed Germany had half of its capacity renewable. US has 16% of its capacity renewable. We're big on nuclear, big on coal, and big on gas. But if you look at Washington state, ah, a lot of blue there. That's all that water in those rivers running down from the glaciers, of course, which are melting and which won't be producing so much electricity in the future. But for now, they're doing fine. And we have these little slices, a little coal from Centralia plant, a uh, little gas, one nuclear plant, and a little bit of wind out in the uh, south e east. Yeah. So, can, but one thing you don't see there is solar. It's like maybe one of those zeros up there somewhere. But when you look at solar irradiance and you compare Bellingham to Stuttgart, there's great tools for doing this, you actually find that, okay, Stuttgart's in southern Germany, right? Bellingham's in northern Washington. Bellingham is sunnier than Stuttgart. It's more sun, right? Almost every month we get more sun than Stuttgart. And yet, and, you know, and yet, when you look at it, this is Germany on the left. It has 464 watts per, of solar per person. So take all their solar divided by 82 million people. And Washington, 4.9 watts per person. It's that tiny little slice there, even though we get more hours of sunlight than Germany. What's going on here? Like, there's a big potential here for doing something. But we're not really trying very hard. If you look at our, our state's uh, targets for manda mandated renewable energy targets, by, 20, by 2016, we want to be 9%. By 2020, we want to be 15%. Right? Germany wants to be 40% by 2020. And if you compare Vermont, which is um, much more inspired by Germany. They have a lot of back and forth between the Vermont government and the German government trying to coordinate all this, what they're doing. Their targets are much more ambitious than Washington. And we have all this renewable energy already, right? We have all this hydropower already, but our goals are so small. So a couple questions to ponder here. What would an energy vendor or energy transition look like in Washington? Could Washington go it alone without the rest of the country like Germany or Vermont is doing? Is there a need for a statewide dialogue or conversation about energy to decide to move ahead to get the public behind it? And what should Bellingham do? Should Bellingham try to become 100% renewable? As, should there be a model village in Washington? I don't know. That's the end. What do you think? <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so students first. Because this is a class foremost, well, Western students, what are your thoughts first? And then we'll give other people a chance. Yeah. How far along is the development of the smart grid? Because I. Where? In Germany, because I hear a lot about it, but people always talk about like how much infrastructure is going to have to be replaced, and like what a large, like how much inertia there is, like keeping it from moving forward. But is it being done? Is yeah. Being oh, big time. Yeah, it's really being done a lot, and there's huge, there's huge areas that have been switched over and very well developed. Are they having to like replace so much of the infrastructure? Or is that kind of is that a no, it's mostly you're adding a lot of switches and things. Okay. So going in and adding a lot of radio consult switches and communication systems. It's, it's expensive, but it's not, one, it's, uh, it's not prohibitory. And there's a lot going on in this country, too. After Obama had took over, uh, you know, the whole, what was that big thing? They spent trillions of dollars. They spent a lot of that on smart grid infrastructure. So a lot of places in this country that have smart grid stuff put in. Yeah? Could you go back to that one slide talking about how like, Germany pays more um, like uh, kilowatt like per hour? That like, one? Long run? That one? That one? Yeah. 
Oh, you just want me to say it again? Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, this is the price they pay per unit, these two. They pay a lot more per unit than we do. This is how many units they use for a house. So Germany, you, we waste a lot. And that's the total price you pay, cost per unit. So they end up paying less because they're so efficient in how they use energy. And we, we like cheap power, but then we want to waste it. Um, so if we had cheap power and we used as much as Germany, our electric prices would be really low. Does that explain it? Yeah. I was just wondering what your thoughts are on like why Washington might be so unambitious, like in the goals for like using more renewable energy. Well, I, I can't comment. I don't know. But Phil can. <laughs> Phil Phil knows. Great. Excellent. Well, it was a little, those numbers are a little bit misleading because there's already a lot of hydro here in Washington State, which does not count towards that nine and fifteen percent figure. So I, I forget if you could yes, like sir. the next slide or two. Yeah. We saw the, the pie chart there. There we go. Okay, so 77% of our energy is already conventional hydro. So, you know, when, when you're talking about another 15%, if you want to count the conventional hydro in there, we, we'd be up to 92%. Yeah. So that's, that's one of the reasons. But in, in, the, in, the, in the renewable portfolio standard that we have, the 15% does not include conventional hydro power. So that's, that's one of the reasons why those numbers are low. And, and Vermont, they don't have any, any kind of uh, fossil fuel generation in Vermont to begin with. So sure. it would be kind of easy for them to get up to those percentages. So you always have to look a bit behind the numbers to really understand what they're telling you. But that, that's why we saw that big disparity there. And again, it's 15%, but it's 15% of the total but 77% of the total is already conventional hydro, yeah. and we don't count that. So what, and what, what does that get counted? What, what, what well, I don't count that. His, 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 his numbers on the renewable portfolio standard, whatever that, yeah, there we go, 9% by, mm -hmm. by next year and 15% by 2020, that 15% doesn't include all of that conventional hydro. So that, that's a state requirement, but but see, that's on top of the 77% that we already have in the form of conventional hydro. Yeah. And, but as far as Vermont goes, they don't have any coal-fired power. They do have gas, they have and gas. they have, uh, they just lost the big nuclear plant. So they have a lot to make up for. It's not that easy for Vermont either, actually, having a lot. I would guess they probably so. import some from Canada, too. Yeah, but they don't count that. Right. For, yeah, for, yeah. Yeah. So as Washington State, should we be talking more about the efficiency of our hydropower in addition to our consumption? I don't think it's the efficiency of the hydropower. I think that's, I don't know if it's an efficiency question, but, uh, but uh, what we need to talk about is replacing or generating more power with alternative means like solar and wind. If we're going to look toward a future, we're going to need to develop these power sources. The question is, do we do it now while we have the cheap energy to build that infrastructure, or do we wait till everything's more expensive? One more question from um, here. Well, so do you know if uh, renewable energy credits count towards these, uh, these yes. goals? Because yes. that might make more sense because we have such high conventional hydro. We don't have room to really get 15% from other renewable sources, but we can still buy from places like where, I don't know where Western yet, uh, it's Ohio, where we, we purchase wind power from them because they use a lot of coal. Yeah. So there's other ways to meet this goal besides actually developing renewable in Washington. Yeah, right. But those, there's problems with that too. Uh, Juliana? Yeah, could you go into a little detail about how the energy cooperatives work? With the uh, yeah. I have a paper on that if you want to see it, a study. I would talk to the people who are doing a study of it, but it's really quite simple. I mean, basically, um, they can work either with a municipal utility or directly form their own utility. And um, it's all set up under the Renewable Energy Act for how they can do that, but, and how it's overseen. It's overseen by municipalities. So uh, it's a pretty straightforward process. I mean. 
that 700 have formed pretty much spontaneously over the few, last few years means it's a pretty easy to do process. Yeah, then I'll add it to some other people. Go ahead. Uh, how were our energy goals actually like, set up? Like, who was in charge of determining those? Bill, you want to talk to that? The, the, the 9 and 15 percent, that was part of I-937 back in 2006. Well, a public initiative yeah, in Washington. Yeah, a public initiative in Washington that, that established those. A lot of other states have them, and they're the similar kinds of numbers. Uh, some of them were done by the state legislature. Many of them were. Uh, yeah. But here, it was it was a, it was a uh, initiative. Yes. Would you like to ask a question? Things. Number one, the mindset or the culture in Europe is so different. Uh, they look at us as just, I mean, they're minimalists, and they don't, they think we're terribly wasteful. So their whole mindset is a huge thing that helps, helps, uh, you know, Germany work uh, towards this, uh, whereas we waste. But uh, the other thing is the four big industries that they hated. Uh, well, we don't like ours here uh, anymore, but how, um, what's the difference between the incredible wealth that, uh, the four industries in Germany have compared to our fossil fuel industry here in the state. It's a huge... Bill might be able to speak more to that since he's the uh, economics could, could expert on utilities. That the, the, the actual what's question. the... Well, I, I'm just curious what's about the, the, four, the four industries, power... Uh, the, those four companies, yeah. yeah. Well, they're going bankrupt now, is what's well, going on yeah, with them. How, how did they uh, fight, fight them? In other words, our fossil fuel industry here in the States is extremely powerful and very, very, and I mean, how do you, they want fossil fuels oh. to be used, and how do, you, well, how do we fight it? How did they do it in Germany? Well, part of the thing in Germany is every board of directors of, uh, pub, of any company has labor unions on the board of directors. So corporations are, ha, in Germany, have much more of an incentive to serve a public interest rather than just the stockholders' interest. So that's one of the things. But, but also, governments are stronger at regulating industry in Germany than they are here. Partly because there's more public consent for that. Dick? It's good to know uh, we are in a class. I think we need to probably maybe stay one more question. OK. Yeah. Do you think it would be a smarter investment for um, offshore or onshore wind for solar? Do you have a thought? What do you think? Um, I honestly don't know. I would expect solar to be um, smart, but I don't really know the capacity of wind, specifically offshore. Yeah. Um, Does anybody speak to the capacity of offshore wind here? Do you know? There is really good offshore wind up in um, off of just north of Vancouver Island, but as far as like off of the west coast, the west coast is on the shelf and so it, it jumps really you know deep quickly and so offshore wind is very expensive you need floating yeah you need floating which is that is very expensive but there is good offshore wind up in canada too, but that would obviously require communication between two countries to be effective to be cost effective you have to have very big turbines it's a huge investment and so far, we don't have any successful offshore wind in the States. Uh, do, Pete? Uh, so I, think look at, I was just wondering, are there any subsidies for uh, lower income families in uh, Germany? With the oh, yes. 33 cents a kilowatt Yes, there are. Yeah, and there's, there's they, dealing with energy poverty is a big concern. So make sure people can pay their bills. Okay, thanks for everybody.